75% of this planet is water. So why do we call it Earth? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm, I get the great, great uh, honor and, and opportunity to introduce my dear, dear idol and friend, um, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Um, obviously, um, she's an oceanographer, she's a, 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 a scientist, uh, she's been the, the lead scientist for NOAA, she's, uh, in, she makes submarines, um, my dog's actually barfed in her submarine shop. Um, she uh, has spent, uh, she, she actually did the deepest uh, untethered ocean walk of any person uh, uh, probably in history, uh, in 1979, uh, living or, or since, and probably spent, spent more time under the ocean than any other living person. And I've, I've gotten the great privilege of spending a bunch of time under there with her. And diving with Sylvia is, is like flying if you're a baby bird um, with your mom. Because she gets, she like brings octopuses in the most gentle way to you and gets, lets you hold them and then places them back where they, they came from. And she shows you things that you were just swimming over going, I'm an American, I'm, gonna, I'm swimming here. And then she shows you, oh my God, but you missed this little Barranco thing. Was, like all these amazing colors and, and, and I mean things that you, can't, you could not make up if you were a science fiction illustrator, writer or whatever. And it, it, it's, it, it, I played a mermaid in a movie, but she is a real mermaid. She has ruby flippers, if that's not magic enough. Um, she is Yoda also, could, because she's also like a, 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 a Buddhist monk or something. I mean, she, everything she says that comes out of her mouth, you just want to write down and remember and tattoo on your body. Um, <laughs> she, she's amazing and just do everything she says. Um, basically, and, and I love you, I love you, Sylvia, and um, oh, she asked me, she told me to say here, Sylvia, but I'm not, I'm not done because I'm going to introduce this man who is also someone that I greatly admire, but I do not know, yet I think that he's incredible. Um, um, he has, probably everyone knows, you know, uh, protected uh, about, this is a rough average, but a bazillion acres of land and protected them privately and also uh, saved a species by protecting a rough estimate of about a bazillion bison and other uh, end endangered species and habitats and things. And, but, but I think more importantly, um, uh, Lester Brown, who I have great admiration for, told me earlier tonight that uh, he is one of the most well-read people he's ever met. And, and he also um, is an incredible humanitarian who's very uh, dedicated to, um, his, to addressing the big pink elephant in the room, which is overpopulation. Um, <laughs> duh. Okay. And, um, and of course, hunger, poverty, and, um, uh, and every other great thing. He's a great man. These are great people. Everyone be quiet and let's let them do their talking. And, and, and the ocean elders, 
is an incredible thing. We need it. it is, this is the heart of our planet, the blue heart, as Sylvia likes to call it. And I'll turn it over to our wonderful Sally, who everybody knows. introduction and she actually stole many of my lines <laughs> uh, so so what what we have here really is two legends one who is terrestrial and one who is deep sea and and to have them together with their perspectives here this evening is really really a privilege now I've had the opportunity to spend time with Ted and also not enough time to look at octopuses and be down in the bottom of the sea with Sylvia, but I hope to do that. <laughs> I hope to do that. And the reason that we're here tonight, it really is to launch the Ocean Elders. And Richard Branson so graciously gave us a little bit about that. But what, what it is, what it is, is some remarkable individuals that are planetary icons, like Ted, like Sylvia. Now, I think there's 12 of them. Jean-Michel Cousteau is one. Neil Young, another. Jackson Brown, another. There's 12 of them. And what the idea is, is that when there are critical issues where there's a tipping point for decision that individuals like this who have a voice, have credibility, have influence, can step into a G20 meeting and speak up for the oceans. And this is what we need. This is what we need. And between Sylvia and Gigi Bryson, who is here um, somewhere, Gigi, where are you? Where are you? She's in the kitchen, I guess. <laughs> She's cooking up something else. <laughs> uh, between the two of them, they have established this, uh, this new budding organization. Now, I'd like Sylvia to give us a little background as to how this idea came about and what her vision is for this. Well, thank you one and all. Thanks for coming in for this evening. I have had the great pleasure of tracing around the Arctic with these two individuals, of diving with the original mermaid, Daryl, uh, and in various ways with many of you in this room experiencing the opportunity, well here at our day, last year, now this year, to try to address some of the big issues. The idea for ocean elders is Gigi's brainchild. Where are you, Gigi? She's disappeared. All right. What an entrance. Well, it, it came, came about on that expedition to the Galapagos, which was a product or a consequence of the wish, my wish, for the TED Prize. Good name, I'd say. <laughs> was, it had to be a big wish, big enough to change the world. It couldn't be a little personal thing. It had to be something really big. And for me, that was easy. It's what I've been trying to do with most of my life, and that is to inspire people to care about the ocean, to think about how the ocean is the cornerstone of what keeps us alive, and to take action for the sea, much as you have done for the land, and that is to embrace it, protect it, restore it. I call the places in the ocean that really deserve special attention hope spots. They're like the national parks, but some of them aren't necessarily pristine, although they really need to be saved while there's a chance. Chesapeake Bay is a hope spot, for heaven's sakes. One percent of the oysters remain from the time when I was a child. The Menhaden, the filtration system for the whole eastern seaboard, has really been hammered. Not because we like to eat Menhaden, bunkers, pogies, whatever you want to call them, but because we grind them up for fertilizer and animal food and omega-3. There's little pills that you take if you get fish oil. There are other ways to get omega-3s, by the way. Don't have to kill fish to get your omega-3s. But we're 
also killing the Chesapeake Bay and many of the other coastal waters because of what we're taking out of the ocean. It's time, since we've been spending all preceding history taking from the ocean, it's time to give back. And that's what Mission Blue is about. It's what the ocean elders are about. It's what all of us should be about, to give back to nature, land, air, the fabric of life, in the land and in the sea. Why? Huh. Not because it's a luxury, not because it makes us kind of feel good, it's because it's absolutely vital to our survival. Underpinnings, as we have been hearing here at our day, our economy, our health, our security, it all links back to taking care, first and foremost, of the natural systems that keep us alive. So, the ocean elders. All right, so there are a handful of us who've reached a few decades and kind of qualify chronologically. But the comment was made, I guess, in early in our day about the elders. And I, I said that, look, in every way, some way, all of us are elders to somebody. And we have a responsibility to those either who are already here or those who are coming along who will look at those of us alive right now and either say, thank you for being so smart, so wise, protecting, protecting the assets and not burning through all of them, but really giving us a chance out there 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. This is the turning point. We've heard it in 20 different ways, maybe 50 different ways during this conference alone. This is critical point in history. Never before have we known what we now know. I can forgive those who made mistakes when they didn't know 50 years ago, but now we know, and there is no reason why we can't use the knowledge and the power we have right now to positively take care of the planet that takes care of us. We speak for all of those generations out there who aren't at the table deciding how do you carve up the ocean? How do you carve up the oil and gas? How do you carve up the Arctic? What are we going to do about the fish? Whatever, it's, it's on the line right now. Either we'll take decisions with wisdom and show restraint, keep the assets as intact as we can, restore what we can while there's still time. I think it's time for me to turn the mic back over to you. Ted, <laughs> you've done on land, you've got two million acres, you've restored, you've respected, you have nurtured, you have worked tirelessly for 25 years on all of your properties to bring them into a natural state. And I can tell you some, some stories about this, uh, which, are, which are relevant to what Sylvia is doing for the oceans. And that Ted, in the, many of his ranches, he's taken out the fences, he's returned the riparian areas to uh, what they would have been originally, he has uh, reclaimed the fisheries, and he, and, and some of his pastures, his small pastures are 13,000 acres, so that bison can do what they do. What bison do is they move. They eat and they move and they eat and they move and they eat and they move. So they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and he respects that. What Sylvia is asking us to do is to respect the ocean in the same way, is to understand how these systems work, and the more reading I've done on ocean ecosystems, if, if the ocean acidifies, we lose literally the fat, it supports us in so many ways. We will have a changed civilization. The IPCO report came out with some really startling figures about where fisheries are on the edge of collapse, where acidification is on the edge of collapse. But the most important thing is that we still have time. And this is one of the things that Ted Turner is so good about. Because he talks about, and I'm not gonna talk for him, but he talks about being in the seventh inning. 
of a baseball game and two runs down. And that we still have time to do this. So he's, he has become a part of the Ocean Elders because he brings this exquisite experience and wisdom from the land to the deep. And I spent plenty of time on sea too. I spent uh, two years, night and day, all, if you add up all of the braces together, and about uh, 50,000 miles at sea, and then thousands more miles in lakes and estuaries. And uh, for 30 years, I spent all my spare time at sea or on the, on the, on the water. And uh, I, I built up a great love for, uh, for water as well as land and all the little critters that uh, live there. So it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be able to uh, serve on this committee. And I'm looking forward to uh, trying to do the best I can to help you, sir. Well, one thing that, and I hope you and all of you can help answer is the great mystery of the sea. What is it going to take to make people care? What is it going to take? We heard Daryl and her colleagues on the stage today talk about getting the superstars, the communicators, to do their thing, to really use their powers, their voices. Everybody has some kind of power. And still, and still, we, we treat the ocean as the great garbage dump. We still do. We allow unspeakable things to flow into the sea. And we take wildlife out of the ocean as if we can continue to extract on the order of 100 million tons every year and get away with it despite the knowing that in my lifetime, on the order of 90% of many of the fish that, that we have extracted and other things too, like oysters and lobsters and clams, here's where they were when I was a kid, here's where they are today, 90% more or less for some, it's only 60% gone, but that is not sustainable. How many humans could be fed with songbirds and little furry things? Wildlife from the land. That's the way we used to feed ourselves until agriculture got up and running 10,000, 15,000 years ago. We have 7 billion people going on however many because we have harnessed the sun's energy through agriculture. But in the ocean, we're still hunter-gatherers. We talk about harvesting the ocean as if somehow we have put something into the ocean that's good for the ocean. <laughs> well, most of what we put in the ocean isn't good for the ocean. And most of what we take out is not good for the ocean either. We have broken food chains. We have taken these ecosystems that have taken all preceding history to put together, and in a few decades, we've managed to unravel them from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Go to my local supermarket, and I can, I can get Chilean sea bass. I can get orange roughy that come from Antarctic waters. The land in Antarctica has been protected for more than 50 years. You can't get away with much on the land, but the ocean, although there's a lot of cooperation among nations to allegedly protect the waters of Antarctica, they're just stripping it of the fish and the krill. Krill right at the bottom of the food chain. It's like taking the, the cornerstone out of the system. We, we now know enough to say, this isn't working. Let's not wait for the laws to insist that we stop killing tunas and swordfish and orange ruffy and cod. And let's just make a personal choice. You can vote with your fork as Charles Clover says, the author of The End of the Line, that has really made waves in, in the UK and throughout Europe. But the United States and other parts of the world, we still eat, are eating our way through the ocean. It's just crazy. So just listen up and get educated. <laughs> go dive in the ocean. I, I, that will change the way you think about fish. We're going to go diving someday. We've made a pact, right? <laughs> Someday, somehow. <laughs> and Jerry, our host, one of our hosts, hosts tonight. Yeah. 
you had just come back from being with those big speckled beauties, the whale sharks. So I'd like okay. to say something yeah. before we because we're running out of time. Uh, I, I I think what we need for the ocean is is an overall plan. Uh, we know all well the things that are wrong, but we need a long term, short term, but we need a plan. But one thing I, I can suggest is right now about, what is it, 10% of the land is preserved in national parks all around the world, 12%. Only 1% of the oceans, right? Yeah. I, I think one, it, the, one of the tenets of the plan should be that, that we immediately, as quickly as humanly possible, as ocean preserves have, have, have reserves or preserves have proven to work. And they, it's better for the fishermen, too, because the fish grow up and reach maturity in the preserves, and then they come out into the open ocean, and they're available to, to be caught. That, that needs to be done immediately. One, and, and we will, if I have anything to say about it, we will work towards, uh, towards that goal and, and lobby for, for that. And uh, one of the problems, because I've studied this very carefully over the years, because I spent so much time at sea, is that the o and reading about it, the o the oceans are pretty mo much what's the word? invisible. They, they, they're they're invisible. We can't see beneath the ocean except when we send camera crews down. And Captain Cousteau was the leader in that. I had the good fortune of underwriting his voyages well, and paying for them, okay. and 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 televising his programs for uh, many years. <laughs> But because it's invisible, we can't see the trash that we've thrown there, and uh, we can't see the fish that are at, trying to swim with no fins, like the sharks are being, they're almost uh, extinct, because they just cut off, they just take their fins and then throw them out, and they can't swim, of course, they die, it's more of the junk. And I have not been in the cent center of the oceans, in, the, in the, what they call the Dead Seas, where, they, where the plastics are, are uh, why don't we get some pictures of that and let people see what it is? But I have never really seen, even in our picture tonight, uh, the, the little film that we had, there wasn't a single shot of, uh, because that is something what, what people can see because it's floating. What a catastrophe it is. You, you can see it, Ted, when the birds go around and pick up, pick up, pick up, bring it back, feed it to their chicks, and the chicks die. And you see on the beaches in the Midway Islands, Kills them, right? they never get to fly. They die on the beach, well, filled with plastic. This is uh, we, 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 we need a plan for the ocean as part of the plan for the, for the world, because you can't just save part of the world. You've got to save it all. I mean, if we lose the oceans and we hold the land, we're not going to be able to hold the land for very long, because whatever we've done to the oceans will uh, come, come, come back to haunt us. And vice versa is true. We, we, we have to, I, I, I made, 20 years ago, I made some bumper stickers up when the arms race was going on in the Cold War. And they said, save the humans, because we'd already had the bumper stickers that saved the whales. And, uh, <laughs> and so save the humans. But now, I think I'm going to have some new bumper stickers made up that say, save everything. Oh, I like that. Woo! Yeah. I, I want to share just a snippet of good news, because it gets pretty depressing sometimes, thinking about how big the problems are, but some individuals in some countries around the world are beginning to follow this good advice. Let's embrace big parts of the ocean and protect them. In fact, it was George W. Bush who, as president, used the, the Antiquities Act to establish what at the time was the biggest place in the sea that even the fish are safe, and that is in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, with 340,000 square miles of ocean through presidential signature. I had a chance to have dinner with him and Jean-Michel Cousteau, the elders at work before the elders existed, and he saw Jean-Michel's film. Film works, it does combined with follow-up and with people who care. Um, it was actually Laura Bush, who, by the way, in the Wall Street Journal, wrote an amazing article 
supporting the idea of marine protected areas and the land. She said in June 8th, it was Ocean's Day, in this story in the Wall Street Journal of all places, why it's important to do what Teddy Roosevelt did early in the 20th century we need to do for the ocean. So imagine having an ally like that. So that was a, one big move. Just recently, last year, the UK established then the next largest area. Uh, it's actually a half a million square kilometers of ocean in the Indian Ocean around the Chagos Archipelago. Also, safe for fish. Imagine there's some place where even the fish don't have to worry about getting caught. Now, just last week, week before last, I was with <coughs> the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands, Henry Puna. He has pledged that by 2012, when they have the next Rio plus 20 meeting in Rio, that his country, little island country with a big exclusive economic zone, he is intent on pledging a million square kilometers of ocean as a protected area and energy independence for his country, wind and sail, wind and solar by 2020. Get rid of oil and gas or any fossil fuel, he says, and he's got his nation behind him. Little tiny country out in the Pacific Ocean with a big exclusive economic zone making waves. There are some heroes out there. We just need to support them and encourage them. And these are two of our heroes, and I would ask you, please, please, through the silent auction and your presence here tonight, please support the, <coughs> yes, and the ruby, there's ruby flippers in there. <laughs> Donated, donated by Sylvia. And but they've been over and under a lot of oceans. They're used flippers, but you know. <laughs> they're they're classic flippers. They're classic flippers. <laughs> so please, please support the ocean elders uh, through your your contributions and also the silent auction and thank you so much for being here and for supporting all of the work that all of us really are doing thank you so much